Well, our guest today on Dashing Dan's Olympic Adventures has lived the dream for many, many Olympic Games. He's been to six Olympic Games, six Commonwealth Games, and he is virtually, uh, for want of a better expression, gun for hire when it comes to being a coach for a number of different teams around the world. I just thought of that as we were going along there. And, of course, when I say gun for hire, I'm talking of the sport of shooting, and that is Russell Mark. He was an Olympic Games gold medalist in 1996 when the sport really became uh, a sport that we took notice of in this country due to the fact that Russell won a gold medal in 1996 in the double trap and his good mate Michael Diamond won a gold medal in the trap, of which he was also able to go back to back in 2000. Russell won a silver medal in Sydney in 2000. He's got a great story to tell. And it's a great pleasure to have you on Dashing Dan's Olympic Adventures for also Aussie Home Loans, uh, who are a magnificent sponsor of ours. And uh, they're able to do any deal you like around Australia. Uh, They can meet face to face and they can also chat to you as I am with Russell today through Zoom. Russell, Mark, great to have you on the program. Good to catch up, Dan. It's been a while. Um, you're looking great down the line here, so good to see you again. And you hear you, of course. You, you, you haven't changed at all, Russell. Just gone a little bit greyer. <laughs> bit, you've just bit reached, greyer for sure. You've just reached 60. You retired from competitive shooting at 50. Your last Olympic Games was at 48. I was doing some research today for this interview. You said, though, you lost a little bit of hunger by your own admission after you won in... 1996 in 2000 when you only lost narrowly for gold you couldn't have lost that much hunger if you kept having a crack yeah it, it's a it's a good question but one i've always answered honestly um i don't ever think i ever competed at the same level again after i won the olympics in 96 i i, I won a world championship the following year and of course you just mentioned i went on to win another olympic medal but I was never quite the same, and for whatever reason, I, I, I guess hunger was certainly a part of it. I I had a, a burning ambition and a goal to win an Olympic gold medal, and in 96 when I won it, I quickly realised there were probably other things I wanted and needed to do in my life. So without sounding too blasé about it, I, I probably changed my direction and my focus after the 96 Games. And, you know, obviously I... I, I build a couple of hotels. Um, the business part of my life has become, uh, obviously, that took over. And with everything that you do as a distraction from the sport, you don't compete as well. And uh, it nibbled away and nibbled away. And I was lucky to stay in it right up until the 2012 Games. But certainly when I went to London, I wasn't really capable of winning an Olympic medal. I probably shouldn't have gone. But I made the team. It's very hard when you make the Olympic team to hand the spot back to the next person. So it wasn't until I got to London and realised how far I was behind some of these younger guys that I I probably said, you know, the the road is going to end here. Wasn't a bad Olympic Games to go to, though, London, was it? I mean, you went to a number of different cities uh, and obviously the Games changed the longer you're in the sport, but uh, London was an outstanding Olympic Games, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. You, you know, and it's funny that you should mention it. It was probably the worst Olympic game for me as a competitor, but I think London ran the best Olympic Games of the the six that I went to as a competitor and won one in 2004 with, with the Olympic team as an athlete liaison officer. I thought London was the best of those seven games. Um, you know, people rave about Sydney, but... You know, the, the village in Sydney was nowhere near Sydney. It wasn't really that great. We no. were stuck out in the middle of nowhere. So no. it was only the Australians that thought that Sydney did the greatest job for the athletes. So it probably was nowhere near the best Olympic Games. How far out of Sydney were you? We were at Parramatta, I think, the Olympic um, village was. It was miles away. It wasn't in Darling Harbour, I'll give you the tip. Well, that's a, that's the middle of Sydney now, but uh, that's 24 years ago, Russell. So maybe they're yeah, 24 Parramatta. years too early. Yeah, no, it was a long way out of um, the part of Sydney that you wanted to be in after you'd finished competing. Let's put it that way, Dan. <laughs> the village itself was great, but it was certainly not in Sydney. It was a long way from the city, that's for sure. So why shooting, Russell? And you started very early and you won your first championship. Australian Championship at the age of 16. You dominated the sport in this country for a long, long time. 
Yeah, look, it was one of these strange things. I was never, um, I, I would have loved to have played centre half forward for Carlton. That's what I would have loved to have done as a sports person. That's what my love as a kid was, but I probably, um, I got my ambitions and my ability a bit mixed up. And so I, I realised I may not play for the Carlton Football Club, and but I did play for the East Ballarat Football Club. I rolled my ankle at footy training one night, went and watched the guys play um, the game on the Saturday afternoon. I was still injured. I couldn't play. Behind me uh, at the Sebastopol Football Club was where we were playing. Behind that football ground, there was a guy shooting clay targets who knew my father. And at halftime, instead of going in the rooms, listening to the coach um, give the players a hard time, he offered me a shot of his gun. And I actually shot clay targets for the first time at the Sebastopol Gun Club when I was 14. And I just couldn't miss. It was one of those things that I picked up straight away. And as you mentioned, a couple of years later, after I'd taken the sport up seriously, I won the Australian Open Championship over in Perth. So I had... I had a bit of a flair as a kid, but then I gave up for two or three years. I went to uni and never competed at all. I had two or three years off the sport completely. And once I finally got a degree in business studies, I started again seriously. And then I went on to make the the next Olympic team in 88. And I guess that's when the story really started from that point onwards. When you got back into the sport, did you have a specific aim to go to the Seoul Olympics in 88 or did you think it might take a bit of time and maybe a realistic aim would be the next one in 1992 in Barcelona? Yeah, it's a good question. I went to the trials for the 86 Commonwealth Games team and we were only allowed to send two athletes and I finished third. I was actually the first emergency for the 86 Com Games. I started again in 85, missed out... On the team in 85, I was still a bit too raw for that. I'm, I think I was finished, ranked about sixth nationally in 85, ranked third in 86, and then by 88, I was ranked number one. So, yeah, I, I did a lot, though, Dan. I did a lot of competition from 85 to 88 and a lot of travelling um, overseas. I was lucky enough to be sponsored by a company called Winchester, an American company, and uh, they pumped a bit of money into me. They remembered when I won the national championship back in 1980 and they they thought I might be okay at it. So I stayed with Winchester all the way up until after the 2000 Olympics. So we had a very close association and my success probably wouldn't have happened unless I had sponsorship from companies like that because it's an expensive sport. You know, you're looking at 50, 60, 70 cents per shot and you're firing two or 300 shots a day. But it's all the travel and everything else. And, you know, if you haven't got people backing you in the in the financial stakes of this, it's very difficult to, to be um, – in Australia, it's very difficult to be world competitive. You've got to get your ass over to Italy. So, Russell, if you didn't have that financial support, would have your story been different? Oh, for sure. Um, I wouldn't have been able to compete internationally in 85, 86 and 87. That were the years that – really the building blocks of my career were those three years. And I was traveling to Europe um, regularly and, you know, I was competing half okay for a young guy. And when, when I fronted up in Italy and I finished in the top 10 in one of their biggest events over there in 85, and then an Italian company called Beretta, which are the world's biggest manufacturer of um, sporting firearms. So they then sponsored me and that really made my life a lot easier. So Without that help, Dan, no, I don't think I would have because I would have been a good Australian competitor, but I wouldn't have been a good international competitor. And you've just got to go to the place where they're better than you. And Italy, for me, was where, where it was all happening. Russell Mark is my guest. You won a gold medal for Australia in shooting in 1996 in Atlanta at Dashing Dan's Olympic Adventures. And we're here for Aussie Home Loans who can look after any loan you like, whether it be an equipment loan, whether it be a sporting loan, whether it be a loan for a boat, loan for a new house, first home buyers, uh, fifth, sixth, seventh home buyers, whatever you like, get in touch with Aussie Home Loans. So you got an opportunity as a pretty young bloke to go to Seoul, to be part of the Australian Olympic team. What was that experience like? Yeah, it was a bit mind-blowing. I didn't realise what I was getting myself into. I didn't compete too badly in Seoul. I think I finished 15th, which wasn't 
terrible, but no one remembers you for finishing 15th. I'll give you the tip there. But um, I then realised what the gap was between myself and the best in the world. And, you know, we're only two or three points out of 200, but that's a lot. You know, I had to bridge that gap. And I did that in the next four years. Um, I I really ramped it up. And by 91, I was winning World Cup gold medals. I won Australia's first ever World Cup gold medal at the uh, event in Los Angeles the year prior to the Barcelona Games. And it, it really put me on a good road from there on. I, I always thought from that moment on, it didn't matter who was in the field. I was a chance to be competitive at it. And um, and Michael Diamond found his feet. He, he, was, he started competing internationally in 91 as well. And without Michael, I wouldn't have been anything because Michael... He was a really good person to have in the team because he always kept making the bar higher. And for a young guy, Michael's eight years older than uh, eight years younger than me. Um, but for a young guy like that to be in the team was great for all of us. He really made the standard world class. Well, he was the clay target shooter. You concentrated, sorry, the uh, the trap shooter. You concentrated on the double trap. Why was double trap more your specialty? Um, because when I was a kid in the domestic disciplines of clay target shooting here in Australia, there was an event called Double Rise, which was an event that I could handle really easily. But Double Trap didn't get invented onto the international scene until 89 and it wasn't in the Olympic roster until after the Barcelona game. So I had to wait until 96 before it was an Olympic event, even though we shot it at World Championships and everything else. Um, once it become an Olympic event, I said to Michael, I said, no matter what, I'm going to follow this. I'll, I'll try and keep competing in the single trap event as well. But I knew straight away if double trap become an Olympic event, that would be the event that I'd be better at. And I think Michael was um, disappointed in some means. He he actually shot double trap as well. We We both competed at the... Sydney Olympics in both disciplines. That was the only time I think at Olympic level we both competed in both events, but he was good at everything. So he pushed me along in that event as well. But when it became an Olympic event and there was an Olympic gold medal on the line, I changed my training from 100% pretty much on single trap to about 80% for double trap and 20% for single trap. So the lure of that gold medal obviously meant a lot. And I just thought in double trap, I had a bit of a head start because I'd been shooting two clay targets in the air for a long time. Excuse my ignorance, but did you have to change your training methods that much in regard to double trap compared to single trap? Yeah. Yeah. It's a good question. Um, yes, you did. You had to shoot a lot more because in double trap, it was really based on how quickly you could hit the first target. So the second target wasn't too far away from you before you could shoot it, which meant I had to mechanically change what I was doing. And instead of just shooting on reflexes, it, it, it meant that I, I, I had to really do something that I wasn't comfortable in is really just stabbing at the first one, shooting it as quickly as possible and then giving myself enough time to shoot at the second target. Whereas if there's only one target in the air, you can be a bit more methodical and a bit more accurate. But with two at a time, you don't have the time to do that. So, yeah, it is a good question, Dan. And, yes, I did. I had to ramp up my training significantly. I was shooting going into the 96 Olympics. I would have been shooting about a 1,000 shots a week. Going into the 92 Olympics, I was probably firing off about 400 a week. Wow. So you've, Big you've basically doubled up your training, haven't you? Do you know why? I mean, it was at the Olympic Games in the early 1900s, the double trap, and we didn't see it again, as you say, till 1996. Do you know why it had such a long hiatus before returning? Oh, like everything. I mean, they give everything a run for a while. <laughs> you know, one of the first um, medals Australia ever won at an Olympic Games, and now it's been changed. But back in 1900, Donald McIntosh um, won an Olympic gold medal at the time. He thought he was shooting in another competition. And after he'd won it, they called it the Olympics. He didn't right. even know he'd won it. And he was in actually the Australian Hall of Fame for quite a few years. Then, as you say, they took... Um, they changed the shooting events as they are now. And 
as to why they do that, Dan, I don't know. I mean, you look at the Olympic roster now and there's events in the Olympic Games that I never would have thought we'd see breakdancing as an Olympic sport. But here we are. <laughs> here we are. <laughs> so, Skateboarding and, and rock and sports rock climbing. Rock climbing, I mean, yeah, it changes. Just on that, should they be in? Are they a recreational activity? I, might, I suppose some people might say... That shooting is a regular yeah, activity sure. as well. I'm sure you've had this discussion many times, Russell. Yeah, uh, it, it's a good question. Let, let's be honest, though. The events that are in the Olympic Games now are only events that are good on television. They're not ever going to put an Olympic event on the roster that will not rate well for the NBC in the United States. And rock climbing at the last Olympic Games in Tokyo was in the top five. You know, it rated its socks off. I mean, it, it's it's odd. I don't know anyone that climbs rocks for a sport, but here it is in the Olympic Games. I don't know, you know, break dancing. We've got, at the next Olympic Games in Los Angeles, we've got cricket coming back into yes. the roster. So, you know. How do you feel because, about that? I mean, I, I don't have an issue no. with that. They've, they've just had the World Cup in America, in America. sharing yeah. it with the West yeah. Indies, the T20 World Cup. And that's one of the reasons why I was held there to get it ready for LA. I don't have an, an issue with cricket. So many countries are playing it nowadays. But I mean, I still see breakdancing as a recreational activity. I still see <laughs> skateboarding as a recreational activity, taking nothing away from the talent that these people possessed in those particular activities or sports. And we have to call Yeah, it, it's a tough one. I, I mean, I agree. You certainly don't want to. Um, play the man and not the, the, the sport here, if they're good enough to be at their sport, good enough to be at the top so they can go to the Olympic Games, so be it. It's it's events like skateboarding, I guess it, it, it opens the Olympics up for a whole range of people that would not have had that opportunity. So, you know, it's the X Games type people that obviously now the Olympics are, are catering for, BMX, things like that, that that rate well on television. And, you know, I'm in a sport that doesn't rate well on television. It's very hard to make it interesting for for the general public. So shooting's got a finite life. I have no doubt that after the Los Angeles Olympics, Dan, you might not see it on the roster anymore. I'm not absolutely convinced it'll even be in the Brisbane Olympic Games because it doesn't rate well. It's there. They're, they're struggling to break a new audience for the, the shooting events and probably not so much with clay target shooting, but for rifle and pistol events where they're shooting at a stagnant target, there's no action going on. And if you're not a shooter, you're probably not going to tune in and watch it. And it's very difficult for them to give TV time during the Olympic Games where you're, you're paying millions of dollars per minute to have an ad on TV, well, they don't want to put ads on TV while the sports on that people they know aren't going to watch. And that's what we're up against. It really is a sad state of affairs, though. So you're worried about the future of shooting at the Olympic Games? I absolutely am. I, I, I'm I, not convinced it'll be in the Brisbane Olympic Games. I'm not sure it will. Let's face it, Dan, when, when Melbourne were going to run the Commonwealth Games in 2026... Originally, shooting wasn't in it. It wasn't in the 2022 Commonwealth Games in Birmingham. That was taken completely out of that. Um, it wasn't in the Melbourne um, roster to start with. Then, then they added a couple of events, not the full section of shooting events. And then, of course, the Commonwealth Games were cancelled altogether. But, yeah, it's it's difficult because they're having trouble selling it to TV networks. And it's not, it's not really an anti-gun feeling. It's not that at all. It's... They're having trouble selling TV time for it. Whereas in rock climbing and skateboarding and BMX, they have no problems at all. I prefer to watch the shooting. The uh, And I did actually call it. And I loved it in London yeah. in 2012. Absolutely loved it. I thought it was fantastic. With the greatest respect to those other sports, I'd, I because I've, I know a bit more about it, I prefer to watch the uh, clay shooting and double clay shooting than those other sports. But then well, again, there's a bit of if, I, if I knew as much about those, I'd, I'd watch them as well. Isn't yeah, it, it's a tough one, but that's what it's based on, Dan. It's uh, can they sell TV advertising for that event? And it's nothing more or less. It's come down to that. It's incredible, isn't it? Russell Marks, my guest, dashing down to Olympic adventures for Aussie Home Lines, and they've got over 25 lenders around Australia. So you went in 88, you went in 92, your second Olympic Games. 
what was it like in 88 and then in 92 to be able to, I suppose, uh, rub shoulders with athletes from other sports, not just athletes from shooting, but athletes from other sports? Yeah, in the Olympic Village, though, to be honest, Dan, you're so focused on yourself, you don't really care who else is in there. At the 88 Olympics, I stayed right through to the closing ceremony at the Barcelona Olympics. I was only a couple of points off winning that one. I went dangerously close. It was really tight, that one, but missed out and went home the next day. I didn't hang around. Uh, And as I did from every Olympics other than that, um, I just found that you put so much work into that event when it was over. I just didn't want to stay. So I didn't actually sit around and watch too many of the other events. Um, I just, that was just me. I I was away for so long. Uh, When the event was finally over, I just wanted to get home. But uh, I I do remember in Barcelona sitting down having dinner one night with Jim Courier, who was sitting on his own. And uh, I went down and sat opposite him, didn't even know it was him until we were halfway through the the meal and uh, he said, you know, I see you do shooting. And then he just started talking about where yeah, he used to do a bit of shooting as a kid and I realised who I was talking to. It's odd. It's like a zoo inside the Olympic Village. It's certainly in the food hall. You see a little group of um, gymnasts come through and then the Ukraine women's volleyball team come through after them. It's, it's a classic herd sort of situation in there. You see all these groups of people that – are unbelievable to think you can be one of them. But I've got to admit, if you start getting distracted by that too much, you lose the fact that the Olympics is just another name for a sporting event that you've normally competed in. If you make it out to be too much, it becomes very difficult to win it. And I was very good in the end, I think, of trying to block it out and just treat it like every other event. And uh, I was pretty proud to say that I was never overawed by the Olympics. So I I sort of worked out how to cope with it after the Seoul event. And I think that's the trick. If you're worried about that you could be sitting beside Michael Jordan or you go autograph hunting, you're probably not going to win one yourself. In 1996, you went to Atlanta and Wolf Creek, love the name of the venue. One of the great names, (laughs) I reckon, of uh, any venue that we've had at an Olympic Games as far as I can remember, and uh, you got an opportunity to win gold. You went really well in the preliminaries. How were you feeling when you were going into the final? Did you feel like this was your turn? It was your event yeah. you with the double trap in? Yeah, look, I I guess famously I had a conversation with the, the coach of the team at breakfast that morning, and I did tell him I'd win it the night before Michael Diamond had won. I mean, I'm rooming with the guy. He's just won the Olympics I'm up the next day. You can't get any better than that to be rooming with a guy that's just won a gold medal. Um, and then the next day I was faced with the same situation. And I took a lot of a lot of things away from Michael winning. Absolutely, that made a difference because when you are hanging around with eagles, you're not worrying about the turkeys. And when Mick's there lying beside you with an Olympic gold medal around his neck, it certainly motivated me. And yeah, the next day... It pretty much went to plan. I mean, I finished top in the qualifications and then I really shot a great final. I Just everything went according to how I thought it should go. And I ended up winning it by five or six or six points. I, I think I won it by. And for the last five minutes of that event, I was in a situation where, you know, no matter what happened, you were going to win. And I think that's the only time I've really ever enjoyed the Olympic Games, the last five minutes of that final because of the way the final's conducted, you are in a situation where you really can't lose. Um, And then you got to sit around and look at the crowd and look at the people that have been with you for the last four or five years and, and and your teammates in the crowd. And that's the part that I can remember more than anything. I, I was in a bit of a daze until I got so deep into that final that I knew that no one was going to catch me. And then, then I enjoyed it, but I never enjoyed any of the Olympic games competing probably apart from the five minutes of that final, because it's not, it's not a really pleasurable experience competing at the games. It's gut wrenching. And if you're having a good time, it means you've either won it or you can't win it, one or the other. If you're in the process of trying to win it, you don't really enjoy it. So it is, as you say, it is hard to enjoy because it's yeah. it's all about business, even though it's one of the great sporting experiences. I mean, I'm lucky yeah. to be there as a broadcaster, a bit different to being there as a as a competitor, but obviously the pressure's right on, isn't it? 
the people that walk up to you and say, no matter what, just enjoy it, you want to grab them by the throat and slap them really hard across the face <laughs> and say, you have got no idea what is about to happen here. You cannot have that enjoyable experience if you are a contender to win it. If you put your life on the line for the previous four years and everything has gone into that one moment, pretty hard to say, just go out and enjoy it. You've got to be focused. Um, and they're two vastly different things. But the people that say, oh, just go and have a good time. Well, no. <laughs> it might be nice of them to say that that's what you, you know, your grandmother would say to you, I guess. But anyone that's been there will know exactly what I'm saying, that it isn't enjoyable. It's only enjoyable if you've won it. And maybe if you're, you are that far out of contention, you can sit back and say, okay, what did I do wrong? But even then, I wouldn't find that enjoyable. But it, it's gut-wrenching, Dan. There's no other way to say it. It's, um, it's not like AFL footballers where you get next Saturday to, to respond to the way you played the week before. You've got to wait four years to have another other chance and that's a long time and I'm lucky I was in a sport where I got other chances but if you're a gymnast you might only get one shot at it and that's it. So there was relief when you won did you know your life was going to change like it did you became a pretty popular gold medalist there are opportunities in the media as you said you got involved in business with a couple of hotels it was very different for Russell Mark, wasn't it, when you came back to Australia? You were pretty well known. And before oh, then, outside the oh, shooting world, you probably weren't all that well known. I was blessed, I guess, to win the 96 Olympics because we had a home Olympics coming up in four years' time. And there was there was opportunities to make some money out of that gold medal. And because there was only four of us that won individual gold medals in Atlanta. There was myself and Mick Diamond and two swimmers, Kieran and Susie O'Neill. Um, we were the only four individual gold medalists. So there was a lot of demand and a lot of people looking for you to do things to help promote different things going into the Sydney Olympics. And I was very lucky to, coming from a business background, Telstra picked me up immediately to be their ambassador for their small business awards for the next four years. So they were a really good company, obviously, to have as a sponsor. And it, it opened up a lot of doors for me there. I, I was picked up by ANSET. Um, they didn't finish too well. Not long after the Sydney Olympics, they disappeared. But ANSET were a big sponsor of mine as well. And, you know, I, I had some good people looking after me. So I financially did quite well out of it, Dan. You know, I, I picked up some gigs in the media but they were more for fun I think more than anything I mean I enjoyed my time in the media I, I absolutely did and because I probably transcended out of the sport you know I, I people just didn't see me just as a shooter they could see that I could do other things because you got to remember Dan when Michael Diamond and I went to the 96 Olympic Games it was right on the back of Port Arthur yes and yep. shooting was not the flavor of the month um when Mick and I fronted up in Atlanta, no one really cared less about the shooting team. Guns were not popular in Australia. Well, then when Michael and I won our first two gold medals and we were virtually there for the whole first week of the Games as being the only two individual gold medalists, we actually got a voice again to say, you know, shooting, it's a sport and we're using our firearms not as weapons, they're tools of our sport. And it put a bit of sense back into the argument. So... By the time the Olympics were over, people could separate between the Rambo terrorist type activities that some people use firearms for, as opposed to people like myself and Michael that use the firearms for a sporting purpose. And I think it settled down the argument a little bit um, and it gave me a chance to do other things by getting a voice in the media and people didn't see me as this raging lunatic running around with a gun. They saw, you know, this guy is a legitimate sports person. So the stuff that I did, and I think I first met you um, th through the times when you, you were on the radio, I worked at 3AW, then the ABC. I worked at Channel 7 for a, for a few years on their Sports World program. I, I enjoyed all of that because you met a lot of different people and, I'm a sports lover. So, you know, I in my weekends, I don't go to the shooting range. I try and get to the footy or the cricket or things like that. And being involved in the media, I could do that and look at it from a different perspective, which I really appreciated. And 
I still, um, since I've won the Olympics, Dan, I still haven't seen my football team win a premiership, but we're on track this year to make... Blues. Make, They'll yeah, go the close, blue. I reckon, Russell. They'll go close. I, re- I reckon they will too. So hopefully this year, because 95 was the last time they won a premiership. Since I won the Olympics, I've not seen them win once. And I've been to a lot of footy games since, but not a premiership one. So that's the other thing. I guess that's the point I'm trying to make here. It, it opened up doors. It gave me other opportunities to do things. And I was very appreciative of the, the fact that I had that opportunity. The great Russell Marcus joined me on Dashing Cam's Olympic Adventures for Aussie Home Loans. They've got over 25 lenders around Australia. Russell, just going back to obviously the Port Arthur tragedy, when people knew you were going to the Olympic Games, after Port Arthur and before Atlanta, I think it was about a three-month difference, wasn't it? The Games were July. Yep, correct. Port Arthur was April. I think it might have been around about Anzac yep. Day. Um, did you try and hide the fact that you were representing Australia in shooting because you were a bit nervous about what reaction you might get considering what had happened down in Tasmania? This is a true story. Um, When Port Arthur happened, I was on a flight back from Atlanta going back to Melbourne. I'd been, the World Cup in 96 was in Atlanta. It was in April, end of April 96. And it was the major test event for the Olympic Games. And I was ramping up that year. I was going pretty well, but I won the bronze medal in the World Cup. Didn't win it. I went close, but I was happy with bronze because I knew I was coming back in three months and then I just, I was going to be ready. Um, I landed at Tullamarine. I was in our Australian, with the whole team was with us. We were all in our tracksuits. I had a bronze medal and a guy walked up to me and said, well, you guys are going to be popular when you get outside. And I'm thinking he thinks he must have known I just won a bronze medal at the World Cup. I had no idea he was talking about Port Arthur. And, yeah, you hit it on the head. We were unpopular. People were so anti-gun. And they took it out on us. I didn't do any interviews with the media in the the few weeks leading into the 96 games about how did they think I'd go at the games. They were all talking about John Howard's gun legislation. And we were getting slammed. You know, there are a lot of people that didn't think that us having a shooting team would be a a good fit anymore. There were people that are openly saying that how could they support shooting in Australia anymore? And it wasn't until Mick and I won those gold medals that that changed. I mean, there were people there that just did not want to know about us. But the first week of those Olympic Games, Australia really sucked. I mean, you had a lot of guys that were going to win gold medals that just didn't. Michael Klim, Shane Kelly, there were tons, you know, guys that just, they had them written down for gold medals and they just didn't perform on the day. And the only two people with gold medals were two shooters. So we got a voice and it changed things a little bit. But in that three months, Dan, it was awkward because nobody really wanted us. That No one even thought that we should have a shooting team, it felt like. And yeah, it was a, a, an awkward time for everybody. Did you ever think of not going to the games in Atlanta or was your attitude, I'm going to prove them wrong, that this is just a sport and we deserve a voice for deciding to uh, have shooting as a sport and perform as well as I possibly can despite all the pressure? Yeah, there was no chance of me ever pulling out of the team. Um, I just, everything was on track in 96. I won the world championship prior. Everything was going along exactly the way I thought it should go. And probably winning that bronze medal was better than winning a gold medal. Um, it was it was easier for me to, to get everything right. It, the bronze medal meant I just rectified a few little things that I, I didn't think I had perfectly right. And by the time I went back in July, everything was right. But, um, you know, you touched on it. I was going to prove it to people. You know, I think it's a... It, it, it's not really truthful to say you go over there and say, I won this for Australia. You, you go there and try and win it for yourself. When you see the flag go up the pole or you hear the anthem, you're very proud to be Australian, I agree. But when you're out there competing, if you're brutally honest with yourself, you're out there competing for Russell Mark or maybe my family. But it's not you're not trying to win a gold medal for Australia. I, I think... 
that's the fluffy answer that you say after you've won the gold medal. I think absolutely. You're really happy that your medal went on the medal tally. But if you're brutally honest, who are you out, out there competing for? You're doing it for yourself. Um, and, you know, I just wanted to prove to myself I was good enough to win an Olympic gold medal. I'd been close in 92, and I, I, I'd i won all the other major events, Dan. I'd won the World Cup, the World Cup final, the World Championship. The one event I had not won was the Olympic Games, and nobody in our sport had won all four of those events, and I knew it. Everybody knew it. Um and when I won that one in 96, I became the first person to win all of the world's four major events. So I was doing that for me, not for anybody else, not for the anti-gun lobby or the gun lobby or anyone in between. You were probably, to be brutally honest, you're just doing it for Russell Mark. It had been 12 years since Australia had won a medal in shooting. And not only did you and Michael win gold medals, Desiree Huddleston was able to win a bronze. Yes. A double trap for Australia at those Olympic Games as well. So it was a great achievement by the whole team, wasn't it? Yeah, well, it was a good team. I mean, Desiree's gone on and is now a coach of the team that's going over to Paris with them. De Desiree's still part of the team. And in my mind, she's one of the greatest shots Australia's ever produced. Um, she might not have won a gold medal there, but Desiree had gone out of the sport and had two or three kids and then come back. And it was great that she was a really big part of our team. So, yeah, it wasn't just Michael and myself. We get a lot of the publicity, but you hit on it. Desiree Huddleston and won a bronze medal as well. And, you know, she she went on and won other events after that Olympic Games. We, we had a lot of world-class shooters from 94 till about 2002. Australia really did dominate, no doubt. We had eight, eight years where I think we were the best country in the world at it. Do you think you and Michael winning gold medals played a big part in that? A significant uh, part in that even? You know, it's really odd. When when Michael and I went to the Olympic Games in 96, the Australian team had a high-performance manager. It had a part-time team manager. And that's it. There was nobody else. Now, there, I think there's 16 or 19 full-time employees of Shooting Australia. Right. You know, it's it, the sport changed. The medals that we won... It brought a lot of money into the sport, but a lot of that money has been spent on administration, not on the athletes. And what I'm saying there echoes through every other sport. If you honestly sat down with a lot of other athletes of my era and you talked about how much money is now spent on sports administration as opposed to the athletes, it's scary. And I think they've got it wrong. I really do. I think... They need to spend more money on the athletes and their their day to day needs instead of spending all these money on community development offices and things like that that aren't actually going to help you win an Olympic gold medal. But unfortunately, shooting is like all these other sports. Like hockey's another good example. Once they started winning, they just pump a lot of money in yeah. behind the scenes, and a lot of the athletes struggle a little bit and. You know, I really think we need an inquiry to get the ratio right of our funding athletes to administration because it's not quite right anymore. You and I had this discussion, I remember, on another radio station about uh, eight years ago. You're obviously still very passionate about that topic, and I take it in your own mind, not much has changed in the last eight years. And We were talking about that before and after the Games in Rio. Yeah, it is a massive problem, and it's not just in the sport of shooting. It's in every successful sport. The Australian Sports Commission, this goes back to when the Institute of Sport broke up and there were all these people that needed jobs and they were just pumped out into the into the sporting community and they found jobs for them um, because they needed to obviously pay their mortgages off. But so did the athletes. That's what my argument's always been. You know, you can't... You, these people wouldn't have jobs unless they've got athletes winning medals at the Olympic Games. But a lot of the athletes, they're on the breadline, Dan. You know, a lot of these people have trouble buying a house now. They live in rented houses and they they don't have the enjoyable life that uh, maybe what I did when I was growing up as a sports person. But it, it's really tough for them now and it's expensive. And as I said back at the start of this interview, I was lucky I had some big financial sponsors, but these people now, unless they get someone paying the bills for them, I don't know how they can stay competitive. 
Russell Marks, my guest on Dashing Downs Olympic Adventures, Olympic gold medalist in shooting back in 1996. He went to six Olympic Games and six Commonwealth Games as well. And since then has become a very well-respected and excellent coach for a number of countries around the world. So you went to Sydney in 2000. As you said, Russell, you'd lost that little bit of a competitive edge, but you were still in great form. But maybe you were too nice because you had as a training partner the man that actually beat you for gold, who performed pretty well as a teenager in Atlanta in uh, Richard Folds from Great Britain. But you had him train with you. You had him go out on your boat a couple of times. I think even <laughs> you had him live with you as well. What are you doing, Russell? Yeah, he stayed with us for a month. Young Richard, he was 17 in that final in Atlanta. And I took a liking to him. He's a nice kid. I knew his dad well. His dad passed away in the, the period of time in between there. So I had a bit of a soft spot for him. And I did, I, I liked the fact that his attitude, it was good. And um, the World Cup for 2000 was in Sydney, uh, same as what it was in Atlanta. And I won it. I won the World Cup that year. And I probably thought, boy, I'm still doing all right at this. And I really wasn't putting in the amount of effort that I should have been. But Richard Folds was very keen to come and train with me. And I thought, he's exactly what I need because I, he was he is exactly what I was in 96. He was hungry. He, he would do anything to try and win. And I got caught up. I mean, we trained an awful lot at our range in Werribee. My father took him out in his new boat and didn't put the plug in the bottom of the boat and they nearly died in the middle of Port Phillip Bay. I wasn't on the boat. Everyone thought I'd sent him out there. Yeah, it was quite funny, but he survived that and then he beat me in a missing out shoot off to take the gold medal. Um, but I wouldn't have won any medal unless I had Richard there. I, Even though I'd won the World Cup prior, I probably wasn't, you know, I wasn't even ranked in the top I'd say in 2000, I would have been ranked five or six, and that would have been about where I should have been ranked. But on the day of the Olympics, I shot well. I shot really well that day, and I, I went into the final tied with Richard, I think, on the same score, and we were tied again after the final, and then he beat me in the missing out shoot-off. But I really do think, unless Richard was there training with me, I wouldn't have got that silver medal. But... Um, it wasn't quite the same. I was massively um, involved in another couple of businesses in that period of time and doing a lot of other things. But I don't think you ever forget how to shoot, Dan. I mean, no. your reflexes start to go on you. And I was 36 at the Sydney Olympics, and that's going down the hill, I can guarantee you. After 34 or 35, um, your reflexes don't get better. I remember having this conversation with Mark Taylor, at the tennis of all places. I sat beside him at the Australian Open Tennis and we were talking about why he quit. And he said, I could still face guys that bowled the ball to me at 85 miles an hour, but the guys that bowled at 95 miles an hour, he was struggling with. And it was just that little edge that he lost. And I, I felt after Sydney, that happened to me really quickly. Um, you know, and I, I don't know. I made a final of another Olympics, funnily enough, in 2008, but... Um, I did win one more world event in 2003, but after that, it was really hard work at world level. But in Australia, I probably had a bit of a gap on a lot of people. You know, I was still a long way in front of probably the next group of kids coming up. And Michael and I really blocked a generation of shooters. Sadly, the group that were below us, we kept out of the team for quite some time. So we missed a whole generation of people. And that happens, sadly, in sport where you get dynasties. And Michael and I certainly had a dynasty. We were joined by a young guy called Adam Vella, who stayed in the sport for a few years. But we sort of kept a whole generation of shooters out of the team. And then they suffered for it. After that, it, the, the Australian men's team become not quite the same strength because when Michael and I disappeared from the team, we had a group of people that had got no experience. But funnily enough, our women then started to perform well. From 2016 onwards, the Australian women's team, and they'll certainly go to this Olympic Games in Paris as favourites to win again. You know, our girls, for some reason, have just started dominating. And they've, they've looked back at Desiree back here in the early um, 96 and 2000, and they've gone on from there. But she was quite old. Desiree's a little bit older than me. 
he didn't keep a dynasty out. So they got to build on it. And Susie Ballard won a gold medal. Catherine Skinner's won a gold medal. And now we've got Penny Smith, um, a young girl from down Warrnambool Way, is a chance to win a gold medal in Paris. So that um, it's been a pleasing side of the sport to see that. So you were in Sydney, as you mentioned. I mean, I suppose, and you've mentioned too, that the facilities for the village weren't great. They were a fair way away at Parramatta. Oh, it's just the geographical location, Dan. I mean, when you finish your, your events, you want to walk out of the village and be in the middle of the city, like you, you are do. in most of them. But Parramatta's a long way from the middle of the city in Sydney, I can tell you. It's it's It certainly is. But, I mean, I suppose being in a home Olympic Games, it was important for you to do that, Russell. And being the reigning Olympic champion, uh, there was – that incentive wasn't there. I'm at a home Olympic Games. I've had a lot on my plate in the last four years and shooting probably hasn't been at the forefront of that plate, if you know what I mean, but it's still an opportunity to represent my country in a sport I've won a gold medal in, in my home country. Yeah, look, there's nothing like a home Olympic Games. And, you know, I was lucky enough to get a home Commonwealth Games as well. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it, it is easier, absolutely. The, the, your home ground is the best ground to compete on. And I'd spend a whole year, it felt like, in, in Sydney going back and forth. I certainly... I didn't take up the opportunity to go and live at the Institute of Sport or anything like that. I never wanted to do that. I wanted to run my own race and use my own people to to be in my team. So I never really used the Institute people, but I spent a lot of time at the Sydney range in the in the months prior. And that that's was definitely an advantage on the day. You know, and statistics show home Olympic teams do very well for that reason in, in all sports. Is it true, Russell, that you were a bit annoyed with the crowd when Richard missed a shot and they were cheering? Yeah, look, the protocol in our sport is not to cheer when someone misses, but you've got to appreciate the people that buy tickets for a shooting event have never seen a shooting event in their life. They've right. never really been there. And it's like golf, you know, when someone misses a putt, you don't cheer and yell. And Richard did miss at one stage. I had to turn around and tell him to be quiet because it was it was putting me off as well to hear them cheer. I was very lucky, Danny, in Atlanta when I won the Olympic final. There were no Americans in that final. No Americans qualified at their home Olympics, which was unbelievable. I, I honestly thought I'd have to beat two Americans, as Michael did, to, to win his gold medal. He beat Americans for second and third. There were two guys there that I thought I would have to do exactly the same thing to, and they never qualified. So it was a different experience for me in Atlanta. But in Australia, there was an Englishman who Australians love to hate and an Australian. And every time... On Richard had missed, subtle cheer. And it was embarrassing, you know, and I did have to turn around and tell him just to quieten down. And it probably shouldn't have, um, but if I had have won it by people trying to put the guy off, that's not really winning it either. And I was proud I did that. A lot of people said I shouldn't have, but, you know, that that's just how I would have done it. And I'm sure Richard would have done that if we were both in the Olympic final in London. I'm sure he would have done the same thing. Now, Russell, you said earlier that by 2000, you might have been starting to lose it a little bit, for want of a better expression, that you're in the veteran stage of your career, but you've still competed or hoping to compete in 2004 because you'd, you'd won a world championship in 2003 at the age of 39. Because you'd won that world championship, is that what kept you going in 2004? Yeah, that was out of the blue um, that I won that event, a World Cup event. Um, I was surprised I won it, but that put me in a good position. The, um, you know, because in 2002, I'd been to Manchester for the Commonwealth Games, got a world record score and lost. And by that stage, I hadn't won a Commonwealth Games. Um, I got beaten by an Indian in 2002 at Manchester. I went over there to rain on Richard Folds's parade. We were both in the final. We were both looking at each other. I shot 49 out of 50 in the final. And an Indian beside me who went in one ahead of me in the final shot 49.50 and beat me. So that that hurt. I mean, that knocked me back a bit because I really wanted to win the Commonwealth Games. As, as much as in the world scheme of things, it's not really that big an, an event, but I'd never won one. 
never won a gold medal. We Michael Diamond the day before had got beaten in the pairs event by the Indians. <laughs> of all teams to beat us, the Indians in two days won took two gold medals off me. Um, so that hurt a bit. In 2003, I licked my wounds a lot from that event. That that hurt me as much as any event that I've lost. Um, so in 2003, when I won it, I thought, I've still got a bit of life left in me. So it made me continue on for sure. But of course, you didn't qualify for the Olympic Games in 2004, even though you were going pretty well in the early stages of uh, qualification. Unfortunately, uh your gun let you down, Russell, didn't it? Yeah, $35,000 Beretta shotgun. I blew the barrels up in it through my fault. We, The little part at the end of the barrel is called a choke and they screw in and out. It, it determines how fast the pellets will spread once they leave the barrel. I dropped it on the ground and I wound it back into the gun, but I damaged it and I didn't realise I damaged it. Um, first shot of the last day of the... First half of the trials, I blew the barrel apart, ruined the gun. Actually, it was the gun that I'd won the Olympics with in Atlanta. So that was a bit of history gone that day. And I didn't have another gun, nothing like that. And uh, I didn't make the team. The two guys made the team fair and square. You've got to take responsibility for your equipment. No different if someone blows up a motor at Bathurst. You know, it's you, you can't whinge and complain about it. So you took it on the chin. But, yeah, it put a hole in things because... Um, 2004, I virtually didn't shoot. Uh, and it took a lot to then decide whether I'd want to come back into the sport or not. So the fact you didn't have another gun means you couldn't have an, another shot. And again, excuse my ignorance. If you had another gun, would have you been allowed to continue? Or, or um, is it a bit like what happened to Shane Kelly when he when his foot fell out of the pedal? That was his chance. Well, it, it's all over. Yeah. The guns are so special specifically made for you that just using any other gun wouldn't be the same. And it certainly wasn't the same. Um, yeah. You know, once, once your gun's gone, you're pretty much done. That That's life. Um, it, it, they're all set up completely differently. And I had a, a quite a unique setup on my shotgun. No, that, that's life. I mean, I made a mistake and I had to wear it, but it, it kept me out of the sport for a year. And at that age, you know, I was, getting on a bit then, uh, I was 38 then, uh, whether I wanted to continue on, yeah, it, it took a lot to convince me to come back in 2005. And I probably only come back in 2005 recreationally to start with, just to have some fun again. But we had the Commonwealth Games in, in, in Melbourne in 2006. And for some stupid reason, they just had one trial to pick the Commonwealth Games team going into the wow. Melbourne Commonwealth, one trial. Everybody that had qualified had had a score in the previous two years of over 140 out of 150 was allowed to compete in this trial. So I thought, why not? It's at a range I'd done a lot of shooting at at Lilydale. So I fronted up for the trials and won it. And I probably upset a lot of people I fronted at those trials, but you know, I'd never won a Commonwealth game. So I thought I'll go to the trials. So I put in a fair bit of work, Dan, behind closed doors in the months prior. Once I decided I'd go, I wasn't stupid enough just to turn up there without any practice. But I was probably um, not letting on to everybody how much practice I was actually doing back at my range at Werribee. But when I fronted up for the trials at Lilydale, I was in pretty good form <laughs> and ended up winning, winning the trials and getting into the team in first place. And, of course, your wife, Lauren, very, very good shooter herself, won a number of Commonwealth Games gold medals. Was she training with you, and did that help motivate yeah. you, Russell? Yeah, it absolutely did. We'd had our first trial in between 2005, and, yeah, it, it, uh, it made a big difference because we were doing the nursing capabilities behind the scene as well while we were, we were training, but it, it, it did make a big big thing and Lauren won two Commonwealth Games gold medals um, going into that games prior so she'd had two of those and I had none and it was often brought up at the dinner table how she'd at least won more Commonwealth Games gold medals than me because she finished fourth in the Athens Olympics she just missed out on an Olympic medal in 2004 so um, it made a big difference to have her there training with me so th that made life a little bit easier so 
when the trials come around, it was no surprise to her that I shot OK in them. And I, I was probably a surprise I won them. I wouldn't have said I was the best shot in Australia in 2006. But um, myself and Craig Trimbath went on to win the Commonwealth Games, which uh, w- was the only gold medal I ever won at the Commonwealth Games. I won a lot of other medals, but not a gold one. The only one was that one in Melbourne. What did it mean to you to win a gold medal in your hometown? <laughs> Well, it was well. good because it, it was certainly um, a club that I'd competed at for many years. Um, since 1980, I'd been competing at that club. Um, my father was still alive then, so he got to see me win. The only event he ever saw me win was that one uh, at international level anyway. And it, it, it was enjoyable to win it in front of a real home crowd because a lot of the people in that crowd were from Hoppers Crossing. You know, they'd gone over there for the day to watch it and, yeah, I, I enjoyed it. And Melbourne did a good job of that Commonwealth Games. It was just so disappointing to see that we weren't going to have another opportunity to do it again because a lot of people rated the Melbourne Commonwealth Games as the best one ever. And I I, I would have said that as well. I thought Melbourne did a terrific job of it. It was the wrong choice, wasn't it, with the greatest respect. I know you're a country boy to try and put them in regional centres. Yeah, I, I didn't agree with that. Yeah. I, I didn't agree with the, the rural part of it. I think no. the venues are in the city. Sadly, you know, the shooting venues, the best ones are in the city. And I'm, I'm sure track and field and everybody else felt the same way. I can understand, Dan, why they thought they needed to do that. But, boy, that would have been expensive. And I guess I think we've seen the last of the Commonwealth Games now. I don't think anyone will ever have them again. And that's a part of our sport because it for – Events like shooting the Commonwealth Games is the midway point between Olympic Games. And it's sort of a really good place to see where are you actually at in the world. And Australia does well at the Commonwealth Games, so it gets you into that winning mode. And the Olympics are just down the road after it. But now to have four years between major events... It, it's hard for a lot of people. And I know the Commonwealth Games isn't like winning a world championship or a World Cup event in, in our sport, but the fact that people place so much emphasis on it, it, it really got you into the mood. The great Russell Marcus joined me for Dashing Dan's Olympic Adventures for Aussie Home Loans, and they can look after any loan you like, especially for first home buyers. Russell, can I just go back to 2004? You didn't go as an athlete but you went as an athlete liaison officer. You'd also had some experience coaching a prince in Brunei. It was an interesting period for you. (laughs) And while you were over, is it true, as an athlete liaison officer for the Australian team, you helped the Indian team out as a coach and got your first crack at coaching? Well, it was. I mean, I was this guy's coach. The guy that beat me for the Commonwealth Games in 2002 when I missed out on the team in 2004, the first thing the Indian Olympic Committee did was offer me a job as his personal coach. And they offered me a lot of money to do it. And I thought, this isn't a bad gig. Um, and I'd been coaching this guy for two or three months and we'd had quite a lot of success. Uh, I got on well with him. He was an ex-sniper in the Indian military. This guy yeah. was a pretty cool customer. Um, Raja Baden, Rathor. He's gone on to become the Minister of Sport in India. The guy right. is pretty well connected. But John Coates then contacted me and said, we've got a problem. We've had an athlete liaison officer pull out. Could you fill the gap? And I said, well, John, you realise I'm coaching one of the Indian shooters? And he said, we can work around it. So I did both jobs. So I roomed with John Eels and Peter Brock. We were oh. the three in the room. And What was John that Eels, like? What was that like? It was good. I mean, it was the first time I'd had a lot to do with Peter Brock and great guy. And I actually roomed in the same room as John Eels. And John Eels was the athlete liaison officer for women's rowing. And it was the famous rowing race where the girl laid her oar down in the water and stopped the boat when they were going to lay down Sally, I think they called the lady. Sally Robbins. Sally Robbins. Sally Robbins. Well, John, John was the guy that had to look after that crew. Uh, so it was an interesting time. I had several other sports, but um, John had rowing and it, it was an interesting time to spend it with John. And, you know, obviously then you become good friends with um, 
these guys. Obviously, very sad to see Peter pass away way too young, but John and I have remained good friends, and it's good memories from that month of at, at the time in Athens, and it, it, a good result for the team. What about coaching the Prince? Prince of Brunei was a funny story because, um, you know, I was sitting at, at – we my family had a real estate um, business, a big business in Werribee. It's still going to this day. I don't have anything to do with it these days. But um, we were getting three or 400 phone calls a day from people just wanting to speak to me. This is straight after the Atlanta Olympics, right. the Prince of Brunei. And um, one afternoon, a guy called up and said he was representing the Prince of Brunei and wanted to speak to the Olympic gold medalist, Russell Mark. And the girl that was looking after me, my, my secretary in the office said, look, he's not taking phone calls. Maybe give him a call back in two or three months' time because we're just inundated here. And the guy went back to the Sultan of Brunei and said, Russell Mark isn't taking our phone calls. The guy gave him instructions. The Sultan gave this guy instructions to ring Russell Mark back again. He called. He got Nancy, my secretary, on the phone and said, I'm representing the Sultan of Brunei. We are the world's richest family. We're increasing our wealth by 85 million US dollars an hour. I'd like to speak to Russell Mark. And Nancy, my secretary, made a career move and put the call straight through this time. <laughs> so I did end up speaking to this guy. And that's that's true story. That's how I got to speak to him. We, we hung up on the guy once, uh, but he was persistent. He wanted me to go over and coach him. And that, that was actually the first coaching gig I ever took after I won the Olympic Games. But that was back in 96. So you knew once London... Uh, was held, that that was it for you for the Olympic Games. Yeah. But he knew then that coaching was something you wanted to do. What makes a good shooting coach and why have you been so successful at it with so many countries wanting you, often for a short period of time, to qualify teams? And you've got a great record of doing that. You've got Qatar into the Olympic Games. You've got in India into the Olympic Games. Uh, you've helped Australia get in. We'll get to that in a second. They nearly missed out this time round, but they're in. So you've got a great record. Why do you have a great record? I think because I've actually been there in those Olympic finals and know what they're going to face. Instead of being a coach that's just learnt on theory to actually learn on being there and understanding that, as I mentioned earlier in this interview, Dan, that it's not a fun time. Don't prepare someone to think it's going to be warm and fluffy and every things going to go to plan it never goes to plan really ever I was lucky maybe in Atlanta that went close to the plan that I thought it might go to but generally it doesn't so you prepare them for what happens if it doesn't go to their plan and just getting the fundamentals under pressure is a big thing and a lot of people know the theory of it but don't know how to actually do it in practice and I think that's why I've been successful that I've been able to to install that into a lot of these athletes on this particular day at this time you are going to be faced with this decision so this is how to cope with it. And I think I've been able to get that message across pretty pretty well. And, you know, I guess it's been well because I keep getting jobs. But um, whether or not I like it, I don't know, financially, yeah, I guess financially it pays well. I mean, it does pay well. These countries like Qatar and India have massive budgets. You know, India and Qatar, That's the, they're going to get the majority of their medals out of the shooting sports. Um, because they're good at it. So they pay the best people to come and coach them. So there is a vacancy for good coaches in the world because there's a lot of crappy ones. And I'm lucky enough to say that, you know, you can sort of weed those ones out. And the job that I've been given now is to coach the coaches, coach people how to coach people properly. And that's basically what I'm going to do now with India when the, the, the week prior to the games in Paris, I'll be there with their their team and their coaches that are going to be with the team when they're actually on the ground in Paris, because I won't actually be with them when they're firing the shots in the Olympic Games. I, I wouldn't want to do that, especially after I've just coached Australia for three months. But in that period of the week before, yeah, there's a financial opportunity to make some money out of it. And that's just the whole car, cold truth about this. You can earn a few bucks doing it. Absolutely. I mean, you've got to look after yourself, don't you? You've got to look after your family. You've got to pay the bills. You've got to put food on the table, Russell, all, all those sorts yep. of things. 
You've got to be able to have uh, membership for the Mighty Carlton Football Club as well, don't you? In their, in their quest to win a premiership, you'll get. I'll be back, back for the grand final. Well, I'll you, be back for that. Yeah, you will be. And I, as I said earlier, I think you'll probably play Sydney in the grand final. But uh, I digress. Now you said that you are coaching the coaches. What's the first thing you teach them? A budding to make, uh, shooting coach. Yeah, it's a good. It's a good question. I, I get them to show them how to make their athletes' shotguns shoot absolutely straight. So many of them don't even know how to set the shotgun up correctly. And, you know, I mentioned before, these are such personal tools that if it's they just can't grab someone else's gun and have it shoot perfectly straight. So one of the things I spend a lot of time on doing is getting their gun to be perfect. And, you know, I've probably got a bit of a knack to do that. Um, but you've got to teach the other people to do it as well because you're not always going to be there. And if they change their technique a little bit or they even change their body shape, their gun does not shoot perfectly straight, so they've got to be able to change it. So that's one of the things I really specialise on. Now, you've been with the Australian team, as you said, Russell, over the last three months. For the first time, they missed out in qualifying straight through to the Olympic Games by not winning the Oceania Championships, New Zealand beat them. How concerned were you by that result? And was it an indication that the sport had gone backwards in this country, that they couldn't qualify through the Oceania Championships, which was generally a given? Yeah, it's a shock. I mean, it's the first time in the history of the sport Australia has not got automatic entry into the Olympics via Oceania. Australia's never lost that event ever. I guess sooner or later, Dan, New Zealand were going to find somebody to perform well on the day of the Oceania Championships. And they beat Australia's best shooter at the moment. It's a young guy from Yarrawonga called James Willett. But on this particular day in Oceania, back in November last year, a guy called Owen Robinson from New Zealand had the day of his life and beat James Willett and knocked him out of the Olympic team, which meant James Willett had to then go onto the world circuit this year and get one of the last two spots available because all the spots had gone. There were only two spots left. So that's when I sat down with Shooting Australia and said, I'll work with these guys for three months. I did it free of charge. Um, I, I didn't charge them one cent. And we went to... Doha, Uh, then we went to Baku for the World Cup, which was the last qualifying event. And James Willett had to win that event to get Australia into the Olympic Games, and he did. He won the World Cup in Baku back in May, and that's the latest we've ever been into the Olympic Games. It It was only May this year we qualified. This is the men's team. The women's team qualified back in 2022. The, the women were a long way ahead of the men. Um, but that that goes back, I guess, to the, the dynasty that I think Michael and myself and, and Adam Veller as well created. We created a bit of a void. And these guys like James Willett now are just coming out of that. And now Willett won that event in Baku. You watch him closely in Paris. He might go on and continue this form that he's in. Um, the women, absolutely, they're going to be the ones to beat. But Australia has a good record at Olympic Games in shooting. Don't ask me why. We just seem to go well at that event. Um, because at world level, um, we probably aren't quite the same at world championship level. But Olympic Games, there must be something about it that we sort of rise to the equa- occasion for. And I- I'd be... I'd be surprised if we don't get an Olympic medal out of this team in Paris. If James Willett had not have qualified, how much would have that put the sport back, particularly the men's shooting part of the sport? I know the women were going well, as you said, and uh, their their team was well and truly in a bit like the women's swimming, the, the women's swimmers for Australia compared to the men's swimmers, they're a bit stronger at the moment, but would have it adversely affected in the long term? the shooting aspect in Australia regarding the men? If you know what I mean. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there are 10 shooting athletes in this team in total. That includes rifle and pistol. Nine of them have been to the Olympics prior. There's only one new person in this team out of 10 athletes that are qualified because Olympic experience counts for so much. 
you get the right preparation, you get the everything to deal with pressure is on at the Olympic Games and you learn how to cope with it. But if you're not at the Olympics, you don't learn it. So it does set the sport back and it sets it back four years. So yeah, it would have hurt it. It would have hurt us four years worth. That's the answer to your question. You you don't recover from that in one year. That knocks you back for a whole Olympiad. And funding as well for the men's program? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, everything's based on the benchmark event for 2024. Uh, two, yeah, for this year, there's one event. It's the Olympic Games. Their funding is based on 2024 results in Paris. If they perform badly, their funding will be affected for the following four years. So that's generally, I think, why they prepare them so well, because everybody, even the administrators, need them to do well. Otherwise, they miss out on their jobs as well. So there was relief when James qualified? Very uh, much. Big, or, or big or party that night, Dan. Was it satisfaction um, or relief? No, it, it was relief um, massively. And certainly a lot of personal work for me personally. Yeah, I was rapt to see him win because I've, I've coached this guy since 2016 personally mm. um you know I, I know the guy very well so to be over in Baku at the world cup sitting in the coach's seat five meters from where he's competing from it meant a lot for me personally but it meant a lot more for him obviously as well but yeah there's relief because I'm putting my reputation on the line as a coach I guess too because you know, it's all very well to say, you know, I'll give them three months worth of free work, but if you're not succeeding, you, you're costing them. So it took a little bit of pressure off me also, I guess. And you're commentating, of course, uh, for the host broadcast at Channel 9. You'll be based out of Sydney. I mean, that's not a secret nowadays. That's how most of the <laughs> broadcasters do it. But you're looking forward to the shooting. As you said, you think Australia can win a few medals, particularly on the women's side. Uh, do you see India as uh, the team or the country to beat? In the overall medal tally for shooting, India and China will be impossible to beat. You know, their, their depth, the, the Indian team's depth is unbelievable, but it's only matched by the Chinese team. The USA will probably finish third in the medal tally. In rifle and pistol in Australia, we will struggle to win a medal. Um, we probably haven't got anyone at that stage. In shotgun, we might win two medals. And that'll be our medal tally. That's about all that they'll contribute to it. But two medals is fantastic. Mm. For a team of 10, you know, 20% of the team winning a medal, That if all sports did that, we'd have a big medal tally to bring home. But um, it's it comes down to depth, Dan, and we haven't got the depth or the budgets that the countries, like the Arab countries, you're going to see these Arab countries like Qatar and the UAE and Saudi Arabia over the next decade, they're going to be the teams to watch because they're going to pay for these medals. They're going to get the best people in there and they'll eventually get athletes to compete for them. You can see it right, what's going to happen. And they're going to buy Olympic medals. It might not be in shooting, but you watch in some of the other sports, it's already happening. Um, but yeah, Australia, you know, the Australian budget's tiny. And it's a tenth of what the Indian budget is where you get about a tenth of the results. Yeah, well, that's exactly right. Russell, as you said earlier, you started shooting at the age of 14 by accident when you were watching the footy, playing for East Ballarat, but were injured that day against Sebastopol and the, the shooting yep. venue was just behind you. Someone had said to you back in 1978, and sorry I mentioned the year, uh, which indicates that you've reached <laughs> the big 6-0 and happy birthday. Yep. Uh, if someone had said to you, you'd have the career you've had in shooting, you'd win a gold medal, you'd win a silver medal, you'd be ranked world number one for a long time, you'd be uh, ranked number one in Australia for many, many years, you'd go to six Olympic Games, six Commonwealth Games and win everything and then become a very successful coach, successful media performer, successful businessman, predominantly out of shooting. What would you have said to them? Look, I was just lucky it was a sport where I could do it for that amount of time. As I said earlier, I would have swapped back to be a footballer. But by the time, Dan, that you're 31, your life is pretty much over in sport. I was lucky to be able to compete at the highest level till I was 50. You know, I, I was the last international event I ever shot in was in Spain in 2014. Someone had have said that me in 1978 I'd say you're crazy not in a million years will I still be shooting clay targets in 2014 at that level so yeah it, it is I, I guess it's surprising if you 
sit there and read some of the things that maybe that I'd forgotten that I'd done. Yeah, I'm, I have had a great life. If it ended tomorrow, which I hope it doesn't, but if it ended tomorrow, then, you know, you know, I, I couldn't say that I could have done too much more. Well, Russell, it's been a great pleasure chatting with you. Uh, you're an ornament to your sport. It's always great catching up with you. You've got some great stories to tell. Uh, you put shooting on the map. You've ensured that shooting has stayed on the map in this country and around the world. And uh, I wish you all the best at the Olympic Games and in future coaching endeavours. Thanks so much for joining me and Dashing Dan's Olympic Adventures for Aussie Home Loans. Go well. Thanks, Dan, and good on Aussie Home Loans to get behind it. I look forward to listening to a lot of your other podcasts as well. Great to catch up with you, mate. Thanks, Russell. Good on you, mate. Go Blues.